Okay. My name is Sarah Seegar. I am your host for Experiential Education as Relating. This is session A10, and it is November 4th, 2021. I am, again, Sarah Seegar. I am a former high school teacher. Um, I've been in experiential education for 10 years, and this is going to be about my experience with experiential learning as a K-12 teacher. I'm not a theorist, I'm not a researcher, so this is really all about my experience in hopes of giving you some inspiration and um, hopefully you can take something away from this presentation. I'm going to present for about 30 minutes just on my experiences and then open things up for questions. Um, and being that there's only two of you, maybe we can uh, maybe we don't even really need to be in the chat. If you feel more comfortable in the chat, that's fine, but you're welcome to um, turn on your microphone. And I just would like to learn a little bit about you before getting any further into this presentation, just so that I know what I'm working with. What is your role in education? You can either add it to the chat or you can unmute and um, we can just have a conversation. Oh, I think it is. Let's see. Oh, there, there's everybody. I have everybody on my screen now. Okay. Hi, Alexis. Hi, Sarah. Um, I'll Hi. go first really quickly. Um, I'm Daniel Galassier. I am coming out of Toronto, Canada, uh, working with the Ontario uh, Centers for Learning, Research, and Innovation in Long-Term Care, the Ontario CLRI for short. And I'm uh, working as an interprofessional educator. What that basically means is that um, we're looking to educate staff across the long-term care sector uh, from all disciplines. So the education we provide is multidisciplinary, but I bring up my focus is probably in physiotherapy because that's what my background, I have a clinical background in physiotherapy where I practiced uh, for about a dozen years before entering into education. So now uh, our focus is basically research and, and creating new um, educational tools for the long-term care sector staff to learn to, to, uh, to empower them and to sort of give them tools in their toolkit for, for the unique aspects of long-term care uh, uh, in itself. Yeah, that's okay. me in a nutshell. Cool, thank you, Daniel. How about you, Marcus? Uh, oh. Hello, I'm Alex Brailas. Alexis. Okay. I am located, yes, I was confused for a while. I am maybe in another life, I was named Marcus, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I work in Athens, Greece. I uh, teach in uh, uh, high, higher education in university. I teach uh, psychology and uh, pedagogy students. Uh, qualitative, I teach qualitative research methods. Uh, systems theory, psychology of social media, and uh, research methods, uh, basically. Uh, in my approach, I try to be, uh, to, to base my approach in group work, and uh, I try to experiment with experiential learning. I enjoy more uh, this uh, interactive and making uh, approach. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like to experiment with, uh, with my teaching methods, so um, I like to hear your uh, presentation. Okay, awesome. I think you answered my second question too, which was, um, oh, hang on a second. What brought you here? What do you hope to gain from this session? So inspiration, I heard from you, Alexis. Um, if there's anything else either of you wanna throw out there, any questions you have that I could try to make sure I get to, um, feel free to unmute or add it to the chat. Okay. Um, I am gonna say, so neither of you are, are K-12 educators, which will be, I, I wanna just say before we get going, that I think this presentation is largely about my experiences as a high school teacher, but I think it's very applicable to um, both of your lines of work. So hopefully I can give you something to work with. So I'm just gonna give you some context of how I got to the point of being in experiential education to begin with. I was not always interested in education. It wasn't my dream as a child. I started off in wildlife and ecology field work. So I went to school for conservation. 
I graduated college and I went and traveled around the country working on endangered bird projects. In Florida, I worked with a snail kite. That's this picture right here. I'm, we're um, tagging birds. And I worked with the California condor. And after some time in that field, I just felt that it wasn't for me anymore. Um, and so I wanted to get into teaching. So I moved back to Minneapolis, went to the University of Minnesota for teaching um, to get my licensure to teach high school life science. And the program was wonderful. The University of Minnesota teaching program is great. But in order for me to, um, they, they put me through a student teaching experience, which is typical for K-12 educators. And I found from that experience that I wasn't as interested in education as I thought, based on what I was experiencing in that classroom. It was very, um, very teacher-centered, a lot of lecture, um, very little communication between teacher and students and students and each other, and absolutely zero connection with the community. And I just knew I didn't want that. So it was either I could leave the profession altogether and get back into environmental science, or I could research and see what else is out there. And so I did some research and I found an experiential learning high school in St. Paul, Minnesota. I got a job there and I stayed there for 10 years. Um, it was fantastic. The, the philosophy was incredible. Um, and so then at some point, some things happened in my family and I was the best thing for me to do at that time after 10 years was to leave the classroom temporarily and be home with my own children. And I very quickly got the itch to get back into education. And so I started a blog, Experiential Learning Depot, which at the beginning of that blogging journey was really just stories about my time in experiential learning. Um, and so that became people started reading those stories. And then I had educators reaching out to me, asking me questions about experiential learning. How do I get that in my classroom? How do I transition? How do I practice moving away from the traditional learning environment to more experiential learning? And so that's when I started really getting more into my, this business or this um, organization, Experiential Learning Depot, where I've been working with educators, um, trying to help them through this transition and providing resources for them to use to help provide a framework. So that's where I'm at right now. So what is experiential learning? I think um, there's some misconceptions about it. Experiential learning in a classroom, um, well, let's just talk about the misconceptions really quick. A lot of people associate experiential learning with um, outdoor education or corporate team building or rock climbing and that kind of stuff. And as awesome as all of that is, outdoor education is, is excellent. And I would encourage anyone to take learning outside as much as they can. It doesn't have to be. That's not really what defines experiential learning, especially in a classroom. So this um, list right here that I've put out is, is are elements of experiential learning that I've applied in my classroom. So to make any experiential learning activity experiential, I apply these um, sort of characteristics right here. So one of the biggest ones is clear purpose. And if you've ever worked with directly with students, especially high school students, you've probably heard them ask, what's the point of this? Why am I learning this? What am I going to get out of this? When am I ever going to use this? Um, and a lot of teachers' responses are because you have to, because it's required, because it's going to be on the test. And that's not what experiential learning is. We don't want to answer what's the purpose of this with the purpose is because you have to. We want the answer to be really clear to students. We want there to be, uh, we want the purpose to be relevant, to be meaningful, to be real world, which kind of brings me down to these um, elements here. Experiential learning brings in real world community issues that mean something to our students. It's authentic. So rather than learn about those real world issues in a textbook or even on the news, they experience it through authentic learning experiences. So let's say um, there, I'm an environmental science teacher. So I, I'll just throw out this uh, invasive species. Let's say that's the topic, that's the issue. An authentic learning experience would be going out and working with an environmental scientist in the field or inviting one to come in and speak or, you know, et cetera. So that's an authentic learning experience. And that's a really important piece of experiential learning. 
because it makes the learning experience active. So rather than passively receiving information or teachers delivering information, students are actively involved in the concepts. Um, experiential learning also encourages mistakes. Failure, as John Dewey would say, is, um, is essential for learning to really be able to step back and not just have the experience, but look at what the trials were, what were the challenges, what went wrong, um, what went right, and how can I use that information moving forward? So reflection is a big piece of it. And then these last two parts, which I think are sort of the main framework of experiential learning, is that it's personalized and it's student-led. So by personalized, we're getting away from the assembly line standardized style learning, and you're getting into um, creating personalized learning experiences for every single student. So every student has learning experiences that are based on their interests, their needs, their challenges, their skills, et cetera. And they do this, they make it personalized by um, students leading and directing their own learning experiences. So they design and lead their own experiences while I, as the facilitator, guide. I facilitate and I guide. I'm no longer director of instruction or deliverer of information. I am guiding them through these self-directed learning experiences. So that is really how I define experiential learning, at least for me in my classroom. Okay. So types of experiential learning activities. Um, I'm gonna really briefly go through these. These are learning experiences that my students have. Self-directed project-based learning is the bulk of their experiences. And what project-based learning is, is authentic, sustained inquiry where students develop innovative final products and they share their authentic work, they share their new skills and knowledge with an audience that is relevant and meaningful to the concepts that they took a deep dive into. And these experiences are all self-led. My students, design and lead their own project-based learning experiences, usually based off of their interests. So if they're interested in trains, they create a project around that, that is authentic, that gets them out in the community, that's collaborative. And then community action projects are really similar. Um, it, has, it has the same kind of basic principles of project-based learning, but the end result is that students develop an action plan to solve a community issue that's important to them and then they take action. Problem-based learning is a very broad term. Um, it's a broad teaching approach or learning approach. So when I explain this activity, it's just how I, it's, it's the activity that I utilize in my classroom, which is I either give students a theme to go off of, let's say invasive species again, that's a problem in our community, invasive species. So I would have pairs of students choose an invasive species to study, to examine, to gather perspectives on. So they might talk to hunters, they might talk to recreationists, environmental scientists, landowners, politicians, to really figure out what the issue is so that they can come up with a comprehensive plan to solve the problem. It's hypothetical, but it really gets students looking at things from a different angle and from a variety of perspectives and really having a comprehensive plan rather than just picking and choosing um, some solutions that might work. Then maker projects from a design thinking perspective. This is one of my students' favorites, but this is the newest to me. I really just started doing design thinking in my classroom um, within the last few, few years of my teaching experience. And so what it is, is my students create a product that solves a real world problem. So let's go back to invasive species again. They might they look into the problem and they create something that could solve the problem, such as removing the invasive species or stopping it before it grows. Let's say it's a plant. And then they make it, they fail, they look at, at the failures and maybe new materials or, or what went wrong and how can I fix it? They test it and they basically go through this process of trial and error over and over until they have a functioning product. And that one's really fun to watch. And then because I'm an, a science teacher, experimental inquiry is a really big one that I do with my students. And it's basically having students design and lead their own experiments. So rather than me put 
a recipe lab in front of them where they're following instructions and they're given a, a testable question, they make their own observations, they write their own testable question, and they design and conduct their own learning experiences or their own experiments. All right, so this is the structure of my classroom. I'm gonna just paint a picture of what ours looks like, um, especially for you two, since you're, you're not in a traditional classroom like this. Um, hopefully you can just pick and choose some pieces of, uh, of what I'm about to tell you about the structure and the schedule and the setup and make it work for you. Um, so imagine walking into our school and what you see is a huge open room. And that's a really highly collaborative space. So we have a bunch of tables out. Um, we have a big stage where we invite speakers to come in and talk to our students. We have students um, do their presentations on there every time they finish a project. We have quarterly ex ex uh, exhibition nights and they'll present up there. And then along the perimeter of that wide open room are advisories and a bunch of other um labs and studios so we have a recording studio we have a science lab we have an art studio we have a screen printing shop um and then the remaining rooms along the perimeter of that large group room are advisories and that is what i did as an educator at this school was act as an advisor a facilitator of learning so the structure of my advisory was mixed ages and mixed skill levels. So I had anywhere from eighth graders to ninth graders and even beyond people that, kids that were trying to catch up with credit. And the reason that works is because it's personalized. Every student is doing their own thing. Every student is trying to meet their own personal goals. And so if you were to step into my advisory at any given point in the day, you would have students kind of all doing their own thing at whatever point they're at in the process of a project that, that they're working on. So you might have a student in the back that's on a computer um, writing out an email to a community expert. You might have a couple kids in the back room trying to organize an authentic learning experience or invite a speaker in to come in and talk about their topic and so on. So it's all very dynamic and um, you would never see me standing in front of the classroom preaching at kids. It's just not the way that it works. They are, are conducting their own learning experiences while I walk the room and guide and figure out what they need and ask them questions and scaffold. So that's the structure and the setup. Um, the schedule is that um, we have an advisory meeting in the morning. So students come in and we we team build and we just chat. Sometimes we just talk about whatever. We talk about current events. Um, we do project circles where students will share their progress um, of whatever project they're working on and get feedback from their peers. And then 80% of the rest of the day is that independent work time that I was talking to you about. And then we have two hours during the day dedicated to seminars. So that's when I do, I'll do an environmental science seminar, for example, and any student can come in and take that seminar with me. And even the seminar is not lecture-based, it, it's not textbook-based, it's all experiential-based. So this, the experience is happening within that seminar might be based on the theme of environmental science, but it's still student-led, they're still personalized and so on. Okay. So I'm just gonna give you a couple of examples of some of the projects that my students have done. Um, one of my students was really interested in botany and biotechnology, and he was working at the U of M's greenhouse at the time and ended up talking to his supervisor and discovered that um, there's another, he was a PhD student at the time, Brett Barney at the U of M was doing algae biofuel research. And so she, his greenhouse volunteer coordinator, set him up with Brett Barney. Brett Barney took him in and basically used him as an assistant in his lab. Um, he provided my students with all of the tools that he would need to grow and harvest his own algae and turn that algae into, into biofuel. And so um, within that experience, just based on research and based on his connections with these U of M um, professors and researchers, he discovered that there was an algae biomass summit, a conference going on just on algae as a biofuel. 
in Minneapolis. And he ended up getting in touch with Advanced Biofuels USA, which I, at this point, I don't even remember how he got in touch with them or how he even find, found out about them. But he ended up connecting with them and talking with them. And they agreed to pay for his ticket to this algae biomass summit if he would write an article for their newsletter on his experience there. So he did that. And that's what you're looking at right here. It's still online today. Um, and then his final product was from all of that experience and all of those amazing experts he was able to talk to and all of the resources he got from community members, he was able to grow and harvest his own algae and produce oil from it. Okay, another project example, this is one of my favorites. As a kid who is interested in skateboarding, I always get kids that are interested in skateboarding. And he was also interested in entrepreneurship. He was a senior, so he was trying to figure out what was gonna come next after high school. And he decided he wanted to start his own skateboarding clothing brand um, as a project, as his senior project. And so he had to, neither of us knew anything about this. I have no idea how to start a business. I had no idea how to manufacture shirts and make logos and brand. And we had no idea how to do any of that. So we, he really, really did some impressive research and discovered that he would like to screen print. Um, he would like to make a logo and screen print his logo on t-shirts and sell those. Um, and in order to do that, he needed to learn about screen printing. Neither of us had any idea how to do that. So he did some research and ended up finding these two women that have a makeshift screen printing shop in their basement. And they produce flyers and artwork and whatever for, for the community. And they invited this student to come in and show this student how they built their shop and how to screen print. And so he went in there and he gathered all of this information from these two women. And then he took that information and those lessons and brought it back to our school and built his own screen printing shop in a closet in our school. Um, and the way he was able to do that, the funding all came from this, uh, it was a tech company in Minneapolis at the time that was looking to get involved in these innovative education initiatives. So they, worked with my student, provided all of the funding to build this workshop, to create his shirts, and to host a launch party, to design and host a launch party. They also, um, their marketing coordinator of that tech company came in and worked one-on-one -on -one with our student to help him build a website. They helped him make a logo and work on branding and, um, he wrote a business plan and he ended up eventually having a launch party at a local skate. Uh, it's like a skate park called Third Lair in our town and was able to launch his brand at that party. Um, we also, I'll just talk about this really quickly. We have a travel program at our school, which I was highly involved in. And rather than me coordinate and organize all of these trips for students to take, our students do it. It's considered a project-based learning experience. They do all the fundraising. They do a lot of the trip planning. Obviously, we oversee a lot of that. Um, they plan projects and seminars before we go on the trips, and they organize on-site projects and experiences. And this, we took a Hawaii geology trip. It was life-changing for every kid that went, but especially for the girl who planned this trip. The amount of skills involved in an experience like this is incredible. And I'm going to just quickly go through there. There's not those three examples that I gave you are really dramatic and and profound. Not all students start at that level. Those were all advanced students that had been in project based learning for quite a while. They'd been doing experiential learning for some time and had experience. So there are you know, I'll get an eighth grader who's never done project-based learning or never done experiential learning in his life. He's been used to a um, teacher just kind of preaching at him and giving him work and marking checks, whether he got things correct or not. So this is a really confusing concept for a lot of kids that are new that want to be handed information. So these types of projects, 
um, these types of project examples that I'm going to give you are are more typical or more standard um, than the examples that I've already shown you. So one of my students was interested in colony collapse disorder, the disappearing bees phenomenon. She connected with the University of Minnesota. Again, they've been such a, an awesome resource for us. And those um, there, she found out there's a professor there that is doing research on co colony collapse disorder. And he invited her to come and check out his bee farm and look at his research. And so we just took a whole class trip. My entire advisory went and took a look at what they were doing there. And um, based on the information that she got from this, from this researcher, she decided that her final product would be bee houses that she'd put up in the community um, with pamphlets that explained the phenomenon of colony collapse disorder. So it was really a um, awareness campaign that she did. Um, and then this one, which I like as an example, because the student didn't technically have to leave the classroom. As much as I would love that, I realized that a lot of um, teachers especially don't have the flexibility to leave the classroom whenever they feel like it. So this one, my student did from her chair. <laughs> she, uh, as part of my environmental science class, I had students choose an endangered species to study and design a project-based learning experience around it. She chose sea turtles and she discovered in her research that tourism is a big part of the problem. She decided to make a brochure for tourists to look at um, that gave them tips on how to, how to be responsible tourists in sea turtle habitat. And then she ended up getting online because her presenting her brochure to me is, it's not relevant. I don't gain anything from that. She doesn't gain anything from that. So she wanted a relevant audience to see it. And that's a big part of project-based learning is an authentic presentation. So what she ended up doing was emailing a large number of hotels around the world that are located on sea turtle beaches, sea turtle nesting beaches, and asked them if they would put her brochure either on their website or in their lobbies. And a vast majority of them agreed to it. And so her brochure is still on some of these, um, some of these hotel websites to this day. And then I'm gonna skip this one. This was just a website that a student created. Um, so yeah, you can see that there, there are options even if you can't leave the classroom. And so what are the takeaways of these examples and, and what does this have to do with relating? And I think it's very clear that experiential learning really gets away from the assembly line style of learning. It's not standardized, it's incredibly personalized, very collaborative, um, that's just the nature of it. And some people ask me a lot, what happened to that kid's skateboard brand? What happened to that other kid's algae experiment? Was he able to use it? So if we look at the skateboard company, this student decided not to move on with that. He, he graduated, he took a different path, and that's okay. Because what we want to get out of any experiential learning experience is the skills and the knowledge and um, the experience gained in the process, not necessarily the outcome. It doesn't matter if he has a functioning business right now, that's not the point. I don't go to school every day hoping that every one of my students is gonna have a successful business before they graduate. What I want them to have are collaboration skills and communication skills and the ability to find their own information and to access resources when there's um, a shortage. And so this student did all of those things. So it was a really, impressive and deep and meaningful experience for that student. So that's the end of my presentation and, and my experiences in experiential education. Um, you can contact me anytime at experientiallearningdepot at gmail.com. Check out my website and my blog at experientiallearningdepot.com. We have an experiential learning um, Facebook community, um, but it is really refined to K-12 teachers. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, and I create resources to help teachers really implement these um, experiential learning activities in their classroom.
eventually at some point, I think probably by January 1st, I'm going to get um, kind of a one-on-one -on -one chat coaching thing going on. So um, if you want any updates on that, um, sign up for my email list and, and you'll get that. So I am open to any questions. I just given your, both of your backgrounds, <laughs> did any of, what questions do you have for me? Feel free to unmute or you can add it to the chat. Shoot, I'm seeing here that. Okay. Oh, no, that's fine. Sarah, first of all, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful work. And I love Thank the you. openness of what I'm hearing from you is I think what you're viewing on your students, maybe even without purposefully doing it or, 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 or at least focusing on it, which is a uh, confidence. Uh, yeah, sort of read the confidence through all of that, right? Like you told me that you had no experience with, with the uh, looking at screen, uh, what was it? Screen, um, uh, the printing, screen printing, yeah, screen printing. You had no experience with a lot of these things and you said, okay, here we go. Right. So yeah. I, I think the theme that I heard throughout all of this was, uh, you're building, um, you're building confidence in these students to believe in themselves and believe in their abilities or not be afraid to learn about something they don't know about. And that's an incredibly powerful tool, right? Like it, yeah. it, it absolutely transcends whether the business kept on going or whether they, as a matter of fact, I would, I'm so glad to hear that it wasn't about keeping the business going. This was yeah. in Italian, we say mortis boccio. It's um, a blossoming um, of, of a growth. So, so it sounded like you were creating that blossom to say, hey, wherever your mind goes to next, these are the skills you can bring with you. Uh, so it was really beautifully done. I have one question that I want to ask quickly. You had mentioned in the beginning that when you were creating um, your environment, that one of the things that you wanted the students to do was not be afraid to make mistakes or to make mistakes. So I yeah. wanted to ask you, how do you tangibly create the environment where they feel comfortable enough to make mistakes? Because to me, there's a, a level of of psychological safety that sort of needs to be created for them to be able to feel free to do that. So what yeah. was your approach on that? You know, thinking back at my experience in a classroom, <laughs> there's not a lot of time for, you know, like active thinking. I'm trying to, you know, I think that that's just experiential learning by nature. So we get a lot of students that, like you said, are not accustomed to that style of learning. So it's really uncomfortable. Um, sometimes they just want a yes or no answer. They want to get it right. There's a lot of people, a lot of kids that have that just in, either intrinsically in them or they've been trained to feel like they need to get the correct answer. So I think a lot of it is just time and experience. And, you know, those kids that those three projects um, on the algae and the skateboarding and the trip planning, those kids were advanced and they they had really been through it. So I think honestly, a lot of the strategy there is time and and helping them to understand that it's okay to make mistakes. It's actually better to make mistakes because then you're you're striving to improve, which is a skill in itself. So I don't know, to, to very simply answer your question, I think it just takes time. Time and continual experiential learning, you know? So we don't have, we don't give them the opportunity to, to you know, like we don't give them worksheets, we don't give them tests, we don't test, um, we don't give them um, lectures. So, so right and wrong, correct or incorrect success or not success is just so um it's abstract there's no there's no right or wrong answer so a lot of it is just time and and getting comfortable with that alexis i pass the uh, baton to you my friend oh, okay. all right um it was an amazing presentation. I really enjoyed it and I keep uh, many uh, notes. It was inspirational for me. Uh, I, I will share some thoughts with you uh, maybe to uh, contribute uh, to the discussion. 
And uh, I will start from what Daniel said uh, about mistakes. I keep uh, telling my students from the very beginning, uh, because I work, uh, work extensively with uh, reflective practice on uh, blogs, and uh, I keep telling them that uh, mistakes is uh, something that I learned from a teacher from, of my teachers, that mistakes are learning opportunities. And I keep them to invite them, to, to challenge them to make as many mistakes as they like, because mistakes are learning opportunities. Of, co of course, Daniel, I'm not sure if the trick uh, is uh, good, but this is my mentality, so I keep uh, telling them so. Um, I am thinking about um, all this wonderful uh, work and uh, and a thought that popped up, popped in my mind was whether, Sarah, you have a support, whether you are alone in this, whether you have peer support. And uh, I thought that many educators around the world, possibly, we do, we try to do uh, an experiential learning, active learning, rhizomatic learning, uh, group-based learning, relational-based uh, learning, uh, reflective learning. We try to do some alternative uh, practices and implement them. And I wonder if we are alone in this or somehow we have support, peer support, and how it's possible to uh, somehow create a network of like-minded uh, practitioners, like the one, of course, in the Taos Institute, uh, to support each other, to learn from each other, because I realize from your presentation that each one of us uh, have, has a, a bit different approach, which is very spermatic for the others to, uh, to know and to take uh, techniques from each other and implement them in their own practice. So uh, I'm just wondering about this. And another question that I thought was, uh, as I realized from this your presentation, the setting uh, that you are working is supporting this uh, approach. I wonder how uh, difficult it is to implement such approaches in traditional educational settings with uh, the seats in a rows, with uh, not uh, available places, and uh, okay, the challenge is uh, big, but uh, I think it deserves the time, um, the effort. And uh, okay, these are some thoughts. And thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you, Alexis. I wanna, I, I do wanna comment on a couple of your thoughts. Um, I did work at an experiential school, so it really was designed around these ideas, right? Traditionally, like the school that I student taught in was not even remotely structured in this way to make it conducive. Um, there were, I had 180 students come through my classroom every day when I was student teaching. They had 40 minute classes and I had six of those. So not only was it, really difficult to do experiential learning, but it was difficult to get to know my students. I, I only had such a brief time with them. It was very standards based. So I feel incredibly grateful to have found a school that, um, that did support me in that way. Um, it was really designed around the idea of experiential learning. So I didn't even have to figure out how I'm gonna get experiential learning in my classroom that that was the framework for the school. That was the philosophy. When I first started teaching there, I had almost two weeks of solid training just on the philosophy of experiential education um, or experiential learning or project-based learning. So, um, you know, so I, I feel really lucky to have gotten that support. And then your, your comment about how, how challenging would it be to get into a traditional school? I, I do, if I'm being honest, I do think it's a challenge. I talk to a lot of teachers who reach out for how can I get this in my classroom? Um, you know, I think, I think that you can still do things like self-directed project-based learning 
or even project-based learning in general. If you can't make it, if you can't find the time or your district doesn't support, um, you know, interest-led learning like that, which is really unfortunate, you can still utilize the concepts of project-based learning. Um, I think that there's a lot of, project-based learning is taking at least the United States by storm, whether self-directed or not. There's a lot of collaboration going on in community relationships and um, this whole relational piece can still happen. The structure of my school would be really challenging to implement in a school that has 2000 students in it. That's just the reality of it, unfortunately. But I do think that teachers as independent teachers could fit experiential learning into their classroom to some, some capacity. Yes, go ahead. I, I totally, uh, feel, it's been my experience too, Sarah, in the education that we do, you know, we're not in schools, but I used to actually work as a special needs educator in our the Toronto District School Board in Toronto, okay. and I understand exactly what you mean by that classroom. Uh, Alexis, one of the things we've started to incorporate are, as far as, if your question was more how to how to start to incorporate relational practices that 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 you can sort of infuse in that classroom setting, does that touch on what what you're you're looking at, Alexis? Because I could speak to that if you wish. I had some ideas, but I just wanted to make sure I was addressing your question. Uh, yes, actually, I put uh, all of them in uh, the same uh, side: uh, relational practice, experiential practice, etc. So but as you said the question, I realize that it's uh, different and maybe I think uh, you're right, if I guess right, that relational practice can always be practiced. And that's where I think you can get the small wins. Um, one of the experiences that we heard from other instructors and one that I had myself from one of our teachers in a very didactic, very school-based setup was that if you can't bring the room to you, you make the kids become the room. And he would have us stand in a circle around, around, and he'd have us face each other for certain segments of what was going. He, he had us question each other with what our takeaways were from at the end of the, of, the, of the lesson, to actually stand in a circle and start to talk about one thing that really struck us or that we were interested in, is that his way to infuse making relationship between students and also infusing attributes that students don't get to practice as often as we would like, like active listening, like being able to sit and listen to other people's ideas and start to incorporate or build off of those ideas. The idea of, of, of incorporation of ideas, which is so hard in a siloed kind of atmosphere or environment. And it also started to build relationship in the sense that students who are quiet, who are given a safe space to share, started to find voice. And even more importantly, those students who were always more alpha to share found a space to be quiet and listen. And you started to see this dynamic happening even within the class that I was doing that wasn't present before. And all that was done was taking a few minutes to put us in a position where we could see each other and give them permission for each of us to share on how to do that. And I thought it was such an incredibly effective way to just introduce the idea of relationship almost on a subconscious level that's not drawing attention to now it's time to relate. It was making them realize that after a while, the practice was they wanted, they wanted to get to that point. We in our classroom wanted to get to the point where we got to share, right? And, we, and, and surprisingly, more often than not, after the class was over, we'd walk out talking about some of the things that we were discussing in the, in the sharing that happened afterwards in, in, in groups. So I think there's some power in that if you're looking for that kind of environment or else if you have the ability to move desks, I'm telling you the physical environment, we use it in theater all the time. We take theater type games and we it, infuse them into educational practice. Um, and so creating a physical environment where the desks are facing each other or the chairs are turned is also another powerful tool that you can even use. And it's very simple to turn back afterwards if you don't want to break the rules of the school or they, you know, the caretaking staff come in and say, what's happened to my room, right? But um, that's just some of my experience I wanted to share. I agree that the structure of the classroom can be really, uh, really incredible. Something so simple. 
something that my um, my school used to do. And again, I'm not sure how this would look in a traditional school. But we would have, we had doors in between our advisories that we kept open 90% of the day. So next to me, the advisory teacher had skills in math and I'm not a math person. So if one of my students needs math credit or is looking or just interested in math, I could send that student over to the neighboring advisory and, and talk to Tom about developing a math project or his students, if they're interested in developing a biology project could come to me. And so we, there's this constant movement throughout the building, let alone even just our advisories. Um, and I think as far as uh, what you said, Daniel, about um, creating the relationship within the classroom, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily, community relations are awesome. And if, if, your students can do that fantastic but even within within the classroom and that peer collaboration and peer cooperation and um that's what our advisories are really for our my advisory was like a family because we would meet together even just for a half hour every morning around that round circle table and you do exactly my question. what you're talking about you know so um you know, there were only 20 to 25 of us and we, it, it was just such a tight knit community because building those relationships within that safe space, as you said, um, it, it's just really profound. So, yeah. So, and then you said something, Alexis, about uh, creating or um developing a community of like-minded people when you do you mean you know like people like us that are really interested in experiential learning um do you mind just elaborating on that comment a little bit uh, yes um, i realize that uh, you are working in your own uh, special way and you develop okay some techniques uh, in a special way that uh, it will be enriching for me to know, like here in this uh, conference, and also myself, uh, I develop some, uh, some techniques mm -hmm. that are process oriented, that are experiential, that are reflective, uh, but uh, okay, usually I share them from time to time in a conference, but uh, somehow if I need support uh, for my practice, mm -hmm. uh, okay, I, I have my own uh, network from uh, uh, psychotherapy practice and the uh, systemic uh, education, but uh, I mean, uh, I, I miss the different other that is similar, but is different enough to make the difference. I mean, to ask you, for example, or Daniel, what do you think about this? Mm -hmm. What you would uh, different in this uh, case, uh, what uh, do you suggest? So I think this, uh, I miss a peer support network or a peer body or uh, something like this, uh, something like the peer supervision we have in uh, therapeutic uh, practice that we miss in uh, this, uh, in uh, educational practice. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the other the other view that will shed life uh, light on my uh, blind uh, spots and help me uh, see Heather. Yeah. Do you find that there are like-minded people in your practice? Do you share um, this philosophy with your colleagues? At my own. Uh, university, I would, I would say no, although when they uh, learn about my practice, some of them, they really liked and appreciated, but they don't practice themselves because I think somehow to do experiential learning practice, you have to be some way uh, either educated experientially in this or somehow uh, naturally position it to this. I mean, it's not, it doesn't come normal to an educator to do all this thing. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Daniel, what do you think about that? Do you have any thoughts? Sorry, I, uh, I feel for you, Alexis, and that I can appreciate that you might feel like you don't have as much support amongst your colleagues, which I think Sarah alluded to is probably being incredibly, it sounds like she has a network of support in a micro level from within her school. And then I think what I'm hearing from you, Alexis, is if you can't get that perfectly, is there a, a larger scale where we can sort of, you can have that support externally so that you can sort of build your, your skills and, and, and your knowledge and your I like to refer to them as tools in my toolkit because Lord knows I, I need them and I try to grow them all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I don't know if I have a, a, a straight answer for that. It's, it's, um, it's perhaps asking those around that might show interest. Um, if you want to yourselves sit together and just create a space where you can brainstorm together on ideas I think what we're talking about here is creating an environment for students to feel safe to problem solve without having an answer in mind. One of the things we try to teach is delayed solution finding. We call it that purposely, particularly in the long-term care sector, because it's sort of ingrained in us that we have to come up with solutions to problems really quickly. It's almost like a, a badge of, of ability to be able to problem solve really quickly. But what we've learned is it's one person's solution to a problem that if you can get multiple ideas about, you can come up with a much more robust solution. So I'm wondering if it might be even Alexis for you to just reach out to those people who might be interested in saying, look, I'm not looking for any answers as much as do we wanna just sit together and brainstorm possible ideas and let it be what it is. Mm -hmm. If it goes a direction, great. If it doesn't, if it splits off, great. And, and just sort of see where it organically goes from there. But I think having the ability to communicate and collaborate that way might be a start. I agree. And I just want to piggyback off of that, that when I was teaching, I felt like that was the only experiential school on earth. It was the only school that had that philosophy because I, you know, that's where I was spending all of my time was in this one place. When I left and I started my blog, I just couldn't believe how many people were kind of hiding with this with this interest in experiential learning, either because they didn't know that it was that it existed or that they didn't weren't aware that this was um, possible in education, or they didn't have people that um, understood where they were coming from, they didn't have support or whatever, but they just kind of came out of the woodwork as soon as I put my blog up. So my point is that I wonder if getting on LinkedIn or getting, you know, searching on Facebook for groups that might have like minded people that you can start to connect with um, and build something from there. I don't know, they might be out there and you just haven't found them. <laughs> yes, I'm quite I, sure think, I think uh, uh, makes sense to me and uh, Daniel's point. Uh, I, I, I hear you say that uh, maybe I have to create this network for myself and uh, to develop it by speaking up my ideas, my questions, and uh, yes, mm -hmm. if I don't have this uh, network, let's create it even by speaking to my colleagues and uh, looking for advice. Yes, the very way, the very moment that I articulate my questions, uh, my, uh, this is a transforming process, my conception of them <laughs> changes. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm getting notification that we're going to be kicked out of here in a minute. Um, so I just want to thank you guys for, for having this conversation. It was really awesome. Thanks for coming. Thank you so much. Good luck to you both. Thank, thank you so you. much. Great job, Sarah and thank Alex. You. Best of luck to you, my friend. So great to meet you both. You too. Thank you. Thanks.